um, uh, and then we'll move on to the rest of the lecture on John 8 uh, from your book. Uh, but I think that this story is um, important enough uh, for us to uh, take another look at it. So um, we're going to begin... Uh, Father God, thank you for today. Uh, thank you for these students. Thank you for this story, um, Father, for uh, no matter how it came to be in the Bible, it is a beautiful story of the grace and the truth of our Lord. So thank you for this story. May we see ourselves in this story. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to begin by talking about two different two words. And the words are this, veracity mm. and authenticity. Veracity and authenticity. Um, so, um, authenticity and veracity are two different things. Veracity means truth, truthfulness. Uh, it means that that it is a true that a, a true thing that is being said or written. So uh, this this story has veracity if it is true. Authenticity means that this story was written by John at the same time as the rest of the gospel. Like he wrote what is now called chapter seven, and then he wrote. Uh, John 8, 1 through 11. Um, something is authentic, right? If it's real, if it's um, correct. Um, you can buy all kinds of authentic things online, right? You know, you can buy a splinter from the cross of Jesus. Probably not authentic, right? But people try to pass that off as authentic, and it's, it's not. Um, so there are reasons for questioning the authenticity of this story. I'm not talking about truthfulness. Is it a true story? I'm talking about was it originally part of the Gospel of John? And I need to tell you that nearly all scholars, including evangelical ones, would say it's not authentic. It wasn't in John uh, when John was writing it. It wasn't part of the first manuscript of John. So here are the reasons why um, nearly all scholars agree on this. The first one is that the earliest manuscripts omit it. Your, your text says as much that the earliest manuscripts that we have of John, we don't have the original of John, but we have very early manuscripts uh, because these writings, especially the Gospels, but all of the New Testament, were seen as authentic and, and truthful from the beginning, and so they began writing it down. In fact, we can we can reconstruct, this is something we'll talk about next year, we can reconstruct, I think, everything but like 10 verses of the New Testament based on the Church Fathers' writing, based on, on uh, what the, how, where their quotes of the New Testament. Um, so they saw it was seen as, as, um, as being truthful and as being um, uh, scripture very early on. The earliest commentaries omit it. So a commentary is a book that talks about scripture, that 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 teaches about scripture. So if you look over at that bookshelf, um, until you get to the bottom, which is stuff I wrote, all of those books are commentaries. They are all commenting on scripture. Um, and so the earliest commentaries, which were written very soon after um, the, um, the Gospels were, after the New Testament was, they omit it. And then in some of the ancient man manuscripts, it shows up in different places. It shows up in John, but it also shows up in Luke sometimes. Um, and so it's not always in the same place in those ancient manuscripts. 
The other thing is that it breaks up the narrative in John. I don't know if I put us. Okay, um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna show you this. Uh, turn uh, to John seven. It breaks up the narrative in John. What do you mean? Breaks up the flow. The flow, I guess. Breaks up the flow. Thanks, George. Okay, so um, he, what is he doing before this, before this story? What's happening? Okay, it's after the Feast of, of Tabernacles, right? And he's um, uh, and he's been, um, uh, been saying, you know, he is the living water and come to me and all that. And then I'm going to begin at verse 45 of, of John seven. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, why did you not bring him? The officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered them, have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities of, or, or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before, gone to Jesus before, and who was one of them, meaning one of the Sanhedrin, said to them, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. Now go to 8.12, where it says, Again Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world, whoever follows me. Doesn't it make sense that Jesus is still in the temple, and he's saying, I am the living water, I am the light of the world. Uh, and uh, he's continuing his teaching. Um, so it breaks up the flow of the narrative to have this this... You know, they all went to their own house, but the next morning, uh, and then neither do I condemn you going to sin no more, and then Jesus spoke again. It fits better uh, without that in it. And originally, it wasn't there. Um, and then the language and the grammar are, are, are different uh, in those 12 verses than they are elsewhere in John. John, as you've probably noticed already, John's style is pretty uh, obvious, right? You can you can pick it out. Uh, if you look at First John, he he says almost the exact same thing that he says in John one, and life and light are still important themes. So if you read John, he has a very distinct style, but the language and the grammar of this story are different. A number of words are in this story that are found nowhere else in John's writings. But they are found in the Synoptic Gospels. So the style is much more like the Synoptic Gospels that are telling stories of what Jesus did. Jesus is telling more who Jesus is. John is telling more who Jesus is. We talked about that early uh, in the year. So the style is more like the Synoptics as well. So I believe that this isn't authentic. This wasn't originally part of John. Um, and wasn't written by John. It doesn't read like uh, John's writings. But the, the real question is, is it a true story? Is it a true story? Did this really happen? So let's talk about the veracity of this story, the truthfulness of this story. It is a very early story, meaning it, it was being circulated very early on. Uh, in fact... The, the uh, church's first historian, Eusebius, uh, learned the story from the pious. It's not a fruit. It's a man. Um, who lived during the time of the gospel writers. He was not himself an eyewitness of Jesus, but he knew John. Uh, in fact, I think he was John's, like John, he was John's disciple. Uh, and so uh, he, he, during the time of the gospel writers. So is he a good uh, witness to this story? Absolutely. He's a reliable witness. So this story, therefore, is just as old as the stories in the gospel. And, it, and it's very typical of the types of stories found in the synoptic gospel. 
So then why isn't it in there? Why wasn't it originally in there somewhere? Anybody want to, anybody want to take a stab at that? Yeah. It kind of feels like a tangent. Well, yeah, but if it were if it were in the correct place, it wouldn't. Why would they have said, yeah, let's not tell you? Yeah. Oh, that wasn't. That's not why, but yes, you are, you so are, you are that, that maybe is, I mean, no. that's the correct use of the word. I don't know if it's true, but I, but the correct use of the word. Well, it could reflect bad on the people that are involved in the show, because, like, um, Jesus said, look, if you throw the first stone at everyone's in sin, oh, they could be like, oh, well, it could reflect bad on Jesus. Yeah, yeah, you're you're really close. You're really close. It was probably left out of the canon because of the nature of the story. Think about this: Jesus is showing mercy to a woman caught in sin, sexual sin, and that sort of thing was unheard of in the church, especially in the second, third, and fourth centuries. So the story probably made church leaders uncomfortable. Um, and we'll talk more about the story, and, and as I talk to you about it, you'll see, like, <coughs> wow, okay, this is a little bit salacious. You can look at it. Uh, and, or maybe it's our next word, however long. Um, so to sum up, I, I believe this is a true story. I, I believe this really happened. Um, and, and it somehow got misplaced in John. And I also believe that there's much we can learn from this story. Uh, so we will treat it, we will, we, we've studied it, and, and we will treat it just as we uh, have the other stories in John. Uh, because I believe that this interaction between Jesus and this woman and, and the Pharisees took place. Um, and, and it's an important story. So, uh, let's look at the story. We're, we're going to begin with um, the trap. Um, we're going to read uh, 753 to 86a. They each went to their own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, Jesus came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in, in the act of adultery. Now, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This he said, this they said to test Jesus, that they might have some charge to bring against him. So she was caught in the act. This is a legal claim. She has broken the law. Um, and uh, the evidence that was needed in such cases was at least two witnesses who saw the actual act at the same time um, and place, but did not participate in it. So to have a legal trial, you had to have at least two witnesses that were eyewitnesses, but not complicit in the crime. So they were eyewitnesses to that very act, but they were not complicit in the crime. That's pretty much basically true of our legal system as well. So for this to be true in this case, so for these guys who are bringing it, for them to, uh, to have seen the actual act uh, and not been complicit in it, not uh, participated in it, for that to be true in this case, they would have had to set a trap for the woman. And I believe they did. I believe they set her up. Uh, they wanted to use her for their own power play against Jesus. They cared nothing about justice. They just, they just wanted to get Jesus. Can I say, where's the guy? Didn't he commit sin too? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he did. They don't care about that. They're trying to trap Jesus and they know that a man might have more and 
Uh, and as D.A. Carson says, uh, and this is uh, true, but also a little bit funny, adultery is not a sin that one commits in splendid isolation. Not something that uh, someone does alone. But the man, particularly in a sexist society like ancient Israel, is not their concern. Um, they could have brought her to him privately. Right? He could, they could have brought her to Jesus privately. But again, that wouldn't have fit their agenda. They wanted to get him in public. They wanted to trip him up in public. Uh, did you have a question? Uh, would they normally, if they weren't trying to trap Jesus, they found, like, in, uh, like if they were caught in adultery, would they actually find like, uh, the man as well? Um, they they might have brought a charge against that person. Um, I don't know how, how often that happened, um, but they, they wouldn't take her to the middle of the temple and put her down in front of somebody. They'd go through the legal process, right? They'd arrest her, they'd, they'd go through the legal process. This isn't the legal process. Um, that, that, you know, that fairness isn't their case. Um, so yeah, adultery is not a sin that one commits in splendid isolation, but but the man is not uh, is not their concern. Uh, they could have brought as and we just said this. They could have brought this woman to Jesus privately, but again, that wouldn't fit their agenda. Uh, and Jesus knows exactly what they're doing. They're trying to trap him. If he refuses to uh, to uphold the Mosaic law and and he lets her go, he is a lawbreaker, and they can charge him with that. If he upholds the Mosaic law, not only will he be essentially signing this woman's death warrant, but he would have supported a practice that at this point in history was not very popular. And he might have uh, been, been um, it might have worked against his, uh, his reputation for being merciful. So therefore, Jesus' popularity and ministry would suffer, and, and that was good enough for them. If he was no longer popular, if nobody was listening to him, if he was like the last band, a one-hit wonder, right? And a band that has one big hit and then goes away and nobody cares anymore. Um, then, uh, by the way, those of you that are like really into music, I got it. This is like totally. You know, I would say it anyway. Um, I was on my way to work today. Basketball players. What radio station was I listening to? Ninety-four point five. Yes, I was. <laughs> my former radio. As in baby boomers. And they played a duet. And I don't think you can understand this, but if you love music, you want to hear this song. Um, so, anybody ever heard of Cass Elliot? Uh, anybody ever heard of the Mamas and the Pops? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cass Elliot was one of the women in that group, the one with the voice of velvet. Crazy. And she died when she was like three. She died really young. Um, and I didn't appreciate any of that, the moms and papas cast out when I was little because they were before my time. But um, but she sang Dream a Little Dream of Me, old, old song, very like big band. And Gary Manilow, don't laugh, Gary Manilow, um, Barry Manilow has just put out a record CD, put out now, download. Um, of duets, and he, he called it My Dream Duets, and it's all duets with people who are deceased. And he's, he's, he's singing harmony, and he's or, put orchestra around it and added things. And so he, it's this duet between Cass Elliot and Barry Manilow, Dream a Little Dream of Me, and it was so beautiful, I probably should have pulled over. I mean, it was just great. So if you love music, look up Dream a Little Dream of Me, Cass Elliot and Barry Manilow, and listen to it. So if we it's find really if we find you on the road and you're just like driving in the wrong lane, it's because you're listening to William. <laughs> that, right? that, that happens. That happens. Yeah. Right. Um, and then sometimes, like when I'm listening to worship music, I'm like, 
And I, and I worship with my eyes closed, which is really, you know, you can't really drive with your eyes closed. So it's just open yeah. like the, but I, yeah, I sometimes, I'm, oh, usually it's this way. Open the sunroof. So yeah. I don't have a sunroof. I could use one. Uh, anyway, uh, all of that has nothing to do with this. So either way, they have that have him trapped. Or did they? So they thought, anyway. So here's Jesus' response. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. So here's Jesus' response. We don't know what he was writing. Uh, there's no way to know. Tradition says that it was Jeremiah 17, 13. Your book also said this. Those who turn away from you, from God, will be written in the dust. In other words, they'll be forgotten. It'll be, they'll be blown away. They won't be remembered. Um, and uh, he, might, he might have been writing that and, and saying that of the people accusing this woman. Um, oh, I forgot the rest of it. Okay, hang on. Uh, will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. So that would fit with the living water thing. Um, maybe it was another verse. Or maybe it was the accuser's sins. Or maybe it was the names of those who had also committed adultery. Some say he was just doodling to buy time <laughs> for, for tempers to cool down. Or he was averting his eyes from the woman who was possibly naked or close to it. Uh, the truth is, we just don't know. Um, but we do know what he says. Um, and, and he says, let him who is out sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. What does that mean? Well, I'll, I'll tell to you first what it can't mean. What it can't mean is, uh, is that they have to be sinless. Or the law would be pointless, right? If, if only sinless people could carry out a death warrant, then there'd never be death warrants because we all have sin. So in stonings, the witnesses of the crime were to throw the first stones. And so Jesus is saying to them, uh, if, if Jesus is saying any of them who are guiltless in this situation and have not also committed adultery. So they are guiltless in this situation. They have not committed adultery. They are the only ones qualified to participate in the stone. And the likelihood is high that the men who accused her were complicit. They, they did have a part in this. So they were not guiltless. And they might have also been adulterers. And the people around them probably knew that. So they couldn't say, I can throw one. And they walked away. So Jesus cut to the quick of their consciences because Jesus knew that they were in fact guilty of setting the woman up, of using and abusing her, and likely also of adultery, maybe even with this woman. So one by one, they walk away. Until Jesus and the woman are left alone. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sit no more. Now, make no mistake about it. The woman is guilty. But Jesus showers mercy on her. And I believe her life was forever changed. Never seen one of those movies where at the end they tell you where they are now? Yeah, right? <laughs> like one of my favorite movies, Remember the Titans, so they yes. do that thing at the end, right? I love that. I love that. I would love to have a, a, a where are they now? Uh, you know, what happened to them after that sort of thing for a lot of people in the Bible, but especially this one. But I, I believe her life was changed by this incident. Um, and so uh, uh, this, is, this is a quote from Dr. Gary Burge, one of my very favorite scholars. The crisp ending captures the seriousness with which Jesus viewed sin and judgment, even the sin of those who accused the woman 
and his gracious forgiving outlook on those who are caught in its grip. He is not letting sin pass, but he is showing grace uh, to this woman. So Jesus is not treating her sin lightly. In fact, he's forgiving her sin while calling her to obedience. A uh, G.L. Borcher, I don't know if I put this in here. Yeah, I didn't put it in here. It's that sin is not treated lightly by Jesus, but sinners were offered opportunity to start life anew. And, and it's the same offer he makes to us. And I believe we are to see ourselves in this woman. And, and if we don't, maybe it's because our hearts have grown hard concerning our own sinfulness. So we've talked about what this says, we've talked about what it means, and now I want to do a little bit of application. Here's the thing. Sin is sin. Mm -hmm. They're not bigger sins and, and lesser sins. Sin is sin. And I'm not sure we always believe that. I've never killed anybody. <laughs> I'm not that bad. I've never committed murder. But apart from Christ, all sin, any sin, separates us from God. Yes? That's what I just about to say. Okay. Um, it all separates us from God. I'm not an adulteress. But my sin nailed Jesus to that cross just as much as that woman's did. In the book of Hosea, God has Hosea um, live out an acted out prophecy. And he tells Hosea something that would have been shocking to a prophet. He said, go to the market and marry a prostitute. And so he went to the market and he found Gomer, a prostitute, and he married her. And he brought her home and he cleaned her off and he loved her and he served her. And Gomer left him to go back to hoard her, to back, back to being a prostitute. And God said, go get her again. And, and Hosea goes back and he gets Gomer. He takes her home. He loves her. And Gomer goes back. And, and, and Hosea uh, chases her down again and brings her back. The point of, the, of, of this acted out uh, prophecy in Hosea is this, and I'm going to use a strong term, but I want you to understand it because it, sin is ugly. All sin is whoredom against God. It's prostitution against God. My sin is whoredom against God, and, and, and so is yours. Do, do we believe that? Do we see that? All sin, every sin. And I would suggest if we don't believe that, that we are in danger of distorting what Jesus has done for us. By dying on the cross so that we might be made clean. There's no virgin. Christ's forgiveness in each of our lives diminishes as we lose touch with the depth of our own sinfulness. When we no longer see ourselves in the drama of the woman, when we feel free from accusation and judgment, we lose sight of God's grace. Jesus is not simply committed to the requirements of the law, but to the care and the transformation of the woman before him. And every person who likewise brings a debt of sin into the circle where he sits. I am an adulterous woman. Not against me. We are all adulterous men and women. I have in my sin committed adultery against God. I have been unfaithful to Him. And so have you. That's us in that circle of accusers saying, Look what she did. Look what he did. And, and ignoring our own sin. And Christ offers us forgiveness instead of condemnation. And, and may I never, may we never use his mercy as an excuse for us. But rather, may we, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that he gives us and we are lost. Father, thank you for this story. I love this story. I'm so grateful it made its way. Uh, Father, might we um, desire 
to live for you. And, and when we fall short of that, may we fall on our knees and, and ask for mercy and repent and turn back to you. We've already forgiven you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, that's it for today.